Ladies, you did a good job. That was beautiful. Man, we've had good singing up here this morning. Hallelujah. But the main thing is the Almighty showed up. And when he shows up, about everything has to go right, doesn't it? Turn to Matthew chapter 16 with me this morning, please. Levi the publican, Matthew chapter number 16. Verse number 13. I believe this was the first scripture that I ever preached over the uh, Basswood Baptist Church that night after I sweat blood <laughs> and told Bill Cardwell God called me to preach that morning. Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Father, bless this holy book now and give me the unction to preach it this morning and open the hearts of the people to receive your word. In thy holy name, amen. amen. Obviously from the text, there's power in the church because we can bind and we can loose. And that's a powerful thing for God to give the church of God something like that. I hadn't planned on turning here, but I'm going to turn to John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20 and verse number 22, the Lord Jesus speaks to his disciples and he tells them this. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now watch verse 23. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. That's a powerful thing. Bind and loose, remit and retain. When it comes to man's relationship with God, the church of God is right smack in the middle. He says to them, the gates of hell are going to come against you. Satan hates you and he despises you and he's going to do everything that he can to destroy you. But you see the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church. By making the statement that he would build the church, he doesn't leave it up to me to do the job. He didn't leave it up to an organization to do that. He didn't leave it up to a family to do that. He certainly didn't leave it up to the government to do that. But he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Hell has gates. We find out about that in the book of Jonah when Jonah was swallowed up by that whale. He said, the gates of hell wrap themselves about me. And all that as he went down into the deep. So in Matthew chapter number 16, he said, I will build my church. What is the church? It's not an organization. You can organize when you're dead. It's a living organism. It's alive. And for those of us in this house this morning, privileged to be here, you witnessed a move of the Spirit of God. Came like lightning. Came like lightning. Came quickly. It just all of a sudden, God moved in this house. That's the Holy Ghost. That's our heritage. That's what we're about. For the church of God without the Holy Spirit is just a bunch of people getting together professing to believe something. But with the Holy Ghost, it makes all the difference in the world. So the Bible says that he would build his church. The church is the object today of vilification. The church is the object today of, uh, of uh, just absolutely trying to destroy it, tear it down, and take it a piece apart. But I'm going to tell you something about the church, folks. Make no mistake about it. I didn't build it. I don't keep it. I don't keep it going. I don't keep it up. 
I just happened to be a laborer in the field, blessed of God, a messenger that God gave the message to preach his holy word. And so I want you to look at some things about the church. First of all, I want you to notice that it's built upon a rock. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. Now you can argue until the Lord comes back who that rock is, but I believe it's Christ. Amen. Upon the rock, Christ is that rock. In the book of Genesis chapter number 49 and verse number 24, we read these words. Genesis 49 and verse number 24. And his bow abode in strength. The arms of his hands were made strong with the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From thence is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. That Old Testament talks about a stone and a rock. And the stone of Israel is the savior of mankind. Not the stone of the Gentiles, but the stone of Israel. In the book of Exodus chapter number 20 and verse 25, it talks about the altar that is made uh, from stones. And he said something about that. He said, don't raise your hand against the stones and try to chip them away and form some kind of a wall or build an altar from the stones as you find them. Leave them alone because these stones would be polluted if you put your hand upon them. And so it was that when Christ came 2,000 years ago, he was never polluted by the hands of man. He could touch a dead body, but he would not be polluted. Why? Because virtue went out from him, never into him. He never received anything righteous or holy from anybody or anything on the face of this earth. The only righteousness and holiness that was here came forth from him. If you want righteousness and holiness today, reach up and take hold of the hem of his garment and it'll come forth from him into you. You cannot give him righteousness. You cannot give him holiness. But oh, how he can bless your life with what he is to you. In the book of Exodus chapter number 24 and verse number 12, what a remarkable thing. The Lord took Moses to the top of Sinai, and there he gave tables of stone. My friend, these tables of stone were written with the finger of God. The finger of God, my friend, was the Holy Ghost writing in stone a holy declaration of who God is. But this is what's important. The Bible says that God gave these tables of stone to Moses. He came down from that mountain, he broke them, and when he broke those tables of stone, he went back up to the top of the mountain, and the Lord said, now get you some more tables of stone for me to write the law of God into. But the first set of tables God gave him, not man. The second set of tables man had to scrape up from the ground. When the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world 2,000 years ago, he was the holiness of God with the finger of God writing in perfection and holiness. In him was the stone of Israel and the stone that was not broken, dear friend. But when it had been broken, then man had to produce his own stone. I'm glad for God Almighty's Son who came and was the declaration of holiness and righteousness for all of us. There is no higher standard. There is nothing greater. There is nothing more beautiful. There is nothing that more substantial that has a foundation than the Son of the living God. You find a place where the Lord Jesus Christ is preached, you'll find a place where the Holy Ghost makes himself known. You find a place where the Son of God is exalted and lifted up like it is in this house, and you'll find a place where the Bible said it becomes the habitation of God through the Spirit. He walks into the temple of God and the walls are made of stone but they're covered by wood but that doesn't stop there then the gold is placed upon it and only when the gold is placed on the wood that is placed on the stone will the almighty God walk into their midst and it becomes a habitation of God through the spirit the stone represents you in your lost condition dug out of the ground and then placed into that wall and then the wood represents the humanity of Christ that begins to cover you from what you were and then finally the deity which represents the gold is placed upon you and I am not what I am I am what Christ is this is why he can walk into this house today and he doesn't see my righteousness he sees the righteousness of the Lamb of God and believe me friend
hand, he still breathes a sweet-smelling savor. He saw the travail of his soul and is still satisfied with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In the book of Daniel, chapter number 2 and verse number 34, it talks about the stone that was smitten, that cuts out of the mountain, that smites the image on its feet. And that image is the Gentile kingdom soon to come crashing down. In 1 Samuel, chapter number 7 and verse number 12, the stone that Samuel raised up and called it Ebenezer. Everybody's got an Ebenezer. That word means from thence God has helped. This is the place that you can put down where God God came to you when you needed him in your darkest hour. He's not only the God of the daylight. He's not only the God of the mountaintop. He's also the God of the valley. He's the God when you're sick. He's the God when you're hurt. He's the God when you're lost. He's the God when you need help. He's there. He's God and always has been and always will be. How many of you know a place you can go to today and there is the stone of Ebenezer and you can say it was here that God raised raised me up out of the pit. It was here that God restored my faith. It was here that God gave me a reason to live again. It was here that God proved himself to me. That's your Ebenezer. And we all need one. I know where to take you to right now where I changed from a child of hell to a child of God. I was saved in a moment from what I used to be into what God made me. But the Bible says in Isaiah chapter number 32 and verse number 2 that he is a great rock in a weary land. Yes, he is. You hide in the shadow of that rock. In the book of Song, chapter number 2, Song of Solomon 2, verse 14, it says that she is in the clefts of the rock. That clefts of that rock is the place where God brings you, where he allows you to get close to him, closer to him than you normally could any other way because you're hidden in the cleft of the rock. In plain of words, if you commune with Christ, you commune with God. If you are in Christ, you're in God. And if you really understand what it is to have fellowship with the Son, not because you're good enough, not because you've done anything, but because you acknowledge he did it all for you. And if you ever have anything, it'll be what you receive of him. And you have to learn that grace, 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 when they laid the foundation of that new temple, they cried grace, 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 hallelujah. If it wasn't for the grace of God, I'd be in hell right now. Grace reached down and took hold of me. Grace raised me up. Grace washed me in his blood. Grace saved my soul. The unmerited favor of God. And in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can hear the seraphim and the cherubim and the angels and a spirit world that you don't even know exist. You can draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. And if you want to draw nigh to him, he is ever there present to draw nigh to you and he'll hide you in the cleft of the rock. Oh, the rock, the rock is Christ. And the cleft starts with a nail prince in his hands. It starts with a nail, with a spear thrust in his side. It starts with that crown of thorn that was cut down on his head. He opened up for you a path to glory through the Son of God. There is no other way to approach the Father. Forget your religion. Forget your church. Forget your spirituality. I know most Americans have cafeteria religion. They think they're so spiritual. But without the Lord Jesus Christ, we have no access to the Father. The church is built upon a rock. The church in Acts chapter number 2, verse number 2, is born of the Holy Ghost. If he had just given you his word and promises, you could accept them, embrace them intellectually. You could say, thank God, God does not lie. But he gave you fire. He gave you purpose. He gave you wind. He gave you water. He gave you the dove. He gave you that fountain that never runs dry. He gave you what you need in the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Everyone in this house today ought to walk out and say, God, thank you for a touch. Thank you for sweetness. Thank you for a breath from heaven. Thank you for something better than this old world. I didn't get it here. He came from above. He doesn't always come like that, but he hit me like a bolt of lightning standing up here. Just all of a sudden, bang, and I'm shouting and glorifying God. So what do you think about that, preacher? How would he hit me again? <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. The church of God is built upon a rock. 
It's born of the Holy Ghost. And then it is alive with the communion of the saints. So what is that, preacher? It's a wonderful thing if you ever experience it. In the book of Galatians, chapter number 6 and verse number 1, it says that if any of you or you see a brother that is overtaken with a fault, the Bible said to restore. He said, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself also. You know what will give you more communion and fellowship is to understand each other. It really is to understand each other. Every last one of us, if we are saved, we've been washed in the blood. We're sinners born of the Spirit of God. Now, I know some of you feel like you're a little better than everybody else. Maybe you can afford better clothes. You might drive finer cars. You may live in a bigger house. Your boat may be bigger than so-and-so's boat. You might have a bigger bank account. You might go to a bigger church. You've been pumped up and you're bigger, 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 bigger. And you know, I've only I've found out there's only two kinds of spurts in the world, former spurts and future spurts. Which one are you? You'll get that in a minute. Think about it for a second. In plain of words, bring us all down to the same level. The foot of the cross, it's level. If you see your brother fall, don't go out the door and start mocking and making fun and running him down and having him for supper. Get on your knees and start praying and say, Lord, I saw the same thing happening to me, but the grace of God spared me from a lot of problems. You understand what comes from the communion of the saints? If you start bearing one another's burdens, if you start praying for one another, the apostle Paul said to do that. You know what would be born of that? It would be the communion union of the saints. It would be the power of God. It would be people praying together to shake heaven and earth. Wouldn't it be something to see 35, 40 people just get up all of a sudden and come down here and fall on their face and cry out to God for one soul. Somebody's sick, they need prayer. Somebody's dying, they need prayer. A family's coming apart, they need prayer. A teenager's rebellious, they need prayer. This one's lost and dead without God, they need prayer. Instead of running your mouth, why don't you run your feet to the altar and get a hold of God? The church is built on that. The Lord said, Peter, you know what you did? You know what you said? You said that you wouldn't forsake me. You said you wouldn't deny me. But you did. Now you go tell Peter and the disciples that I've arisen from the dead. And they found old Pete. They found him out here under a tree somewhere, just like they did old Jonah in the Old Testament. He was probably licking his wounds. Old Peter was saying, I blew it. I ran my big mouth one time too many. He'll never take me back. The Bible says they went and got Peter and said, come here, he's calling for you personally. And when Peter showed up, he said, you really want me back? You really want me back? Do you really want me back? I mean, you know how I ran my mouth? I bragged. I want you back, son, because I love you. I'm your savior. I made you. I know what makes you tick. And I want you to come back into the fold. And old Peter did. And that fulfilled the prophecy where the Lord said, when thou art converted, Peter, strengthen thy brethren have any of you ever been converted I'm talking about you've been in hell and you got brought out of it you've seen these young kids go down the dope road because you went down it you see what breaking a home is and how the children suffer for it because you went through it yourself then after you're converted strengthen the brethren I've yet to see I have yet to see <laughs> I have yet to see a church that understands what it means to bear each other up, lift each other up, help each other, pray for each other. He said, upon this rock I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. But did you know how God's people turn on each other? Oh, don't let it happen to you. You need the communion of the saints. How many of you come on Wednesday night prayer meeting and you hear these poor folks? We got a little girl from Haiti over here that our government is denying citizenship. Somebody ought to be praying for that little old thing. We got a man in here that's got a prostate problem and they tell him that cancer now is, is, is somewhere in his body. Somebody ought to be praying for him. We got a woman back here that's got breast cancer and my friend, somebody ought to be praying for her. We got people in this house with diabetes and they've got leukemia. They got all kinds of stuff. Somebody ought to be praying for them. Hallelujah to God. 
Amen. And so fulfill the law of Christ. It's the greatest law of all laws. It's the law of love. It is greater than thou shalt not. The law of power and communion of the Holy Ghost. Turn to Colossians 3, verse 13. I'll move on, but I've got to park here for just a second. Colossians chapter number 3 and verse 13. Forbearing one another, Paul said... And forgiving one another, if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. I'll build my church upon this rock. And one of the greatest foundations of that is this simple truth. To forbear one another means to put up with each other. It is our nature to run with the crowd we feel comfortable with. But sometimes people are going to be around you you're not comfortable with. But if the grace of God is working in your soul, you'll forbear with them, you'll put up with them. And then not only that, he said, you will forgive them. By forgiving, you receive forgiveness because as Christ hath forgiven you. Now, if I ask you this morning a simple question, which one of you has got the longest list of things that God forgave you for when he saved you? I mean, anybody in this house got a list as long as from the pulpit here to that back door? Anybody got a, got a list as in bold type underlined that God forgave you for? Well, as Christ hath forgiven you, forgive each other, dear friends. Don't try to find a perfect church. Don't let Satan run you here and run you there and wear you out trying to find somebody that's perfect. It's not going to happen. But you'll see built in your midst something that this world will run from if this house has the communion of the saints the way he said it in his word. The gates of hell cannot prevail against you. Glory to God. Amen. The church of God is built upon a rock. The church of God is born of the Holy Ghost. The church of God is alive with the communion of the saints. And the church of God is consecrated by the blood of Christ. In Hebrews chapter number 9 and verse number 16, the infallible text says, For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. The New Testament was ratified, made law, came into being, had power when Christ died on the cross and shed the blood of the new covenant. Now, what does that blood mean, preacher? I can't see that blood. Yes, but everything you are and everything you are, does you relate to God and everything that relates to your sin and each other is based on the blood covenant. Amen. Amen. You take the blood covenant out of it and it's just a place of, of hedonistic good works. It's just a place of, of self-exaltation. It's just a place of social activity. But when you put the blood of Christ into a place, people have to relate to that blood. And as you relate to that blood, you understand, well, what's that blood for? It's to wash your sins away. What's that blood for, preacher? To give you peace with God. What's that blood for? To draw nigh to God. What's that blood about, preacher? That is how I'm saved. Hallelujah. No other way. I don't like that bloody uh, slaughterhouse religion. My dear friend, listen carefully. If you do not accept the finished work, shed blood of Christ, your religion, your so-called Christian religion is no better than Buddha, Hindu, no better than, no better than a Mohammed or any of the rest of it. It's just nothing. You understand that not a single religion on the face of this earth has a redeemer that went to the cross and shed their precious blood for you, but us. I'm dying. Let me tell you something. I wasn't born yesterday. I've been here a while. I know men, I know mankind. We all need a redeemer. Don't stretch your stuff in front of me. Every last one of us have sinned and we need to be saved. And there's only one Savior. Peter, what do you think? What do you mean, what do I think? What do you think, Peter? Thou art the Christ. Yes. Amen. <laughs> the Son of the living God. Amen. And I don't care what anybody says. Amen. That's Peter. Amen. That's Peter. You got him. <laughs> Amen. Peter's the kind that could walk on a mountain when the rest of them were crying in a valley. But he could trip and fall. But I'm going to tell you what, I like Peter. <laughs> I like him. I like Peter. 
I like him because when he spoke, it was spontaneous. Spontaneous. He said, Lord, I'll never, I'll never deny you. No, sir, no way, no hold, no way. He meant what he said, but he didn't know himself. That's Peter. The church of God, finally, looking for the soon return of our Savior. I'll give you four things and come to a close this morning. Number one, the selection cycle. It should have brought to your attention what's going on in the both Republican and Democrat Party when it comes to globalism. Yes. Right. TPP, naphtone steroids, and all the rest of it. That's right. Globalism. What's globalism, preacher? It is multinational corporations, multi-billionaires that are trading on an international scale, making big bucks, and the middle class in this country is paying a dear price for it. They want a global economy. That's globalism. And friend, it is shot through the Democrat Party and it is shot through the Republican Party. Amen. Number two, the occult in your face. CERN, Switzerland. I read a thing the other day, and I'm careful about some of the things that I read and say, but I read this thing the other day that said that a scientist from CERN, Switzerland, said, we've done some stuff that you don't know about that's never been reported in the media. We have seen people disappear, and nobody has reported it in the media because it doesn't fit the media's agenda and narrative. We have seen some scary, scary stuff. And one of them says, I'm done with CERN, Switzerland. And they got out of it. Gothard. They just opened up a tunnel under the Swiss Alps. This is the, I think it's the longest tunnel, man-made tunnel in the world. And on the day that they dedicated it, guess who they dedicated it to? Lucifer. The heads of state all over Europe, including Angela Merkel, or Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, the President of France, President of Switzerland, President of Italy, Prime Minister, whichever, whatever they are, were all gathered together that day while Gotthard was dedicated to Lucifer. They took a huge projector and projected the image of of, uh, of of Kylie, Kaylee, Kaylee, the god of destruction, one of the Hindu gods of destruction on the Empire State Building. One of the things about Kaylee, this is a good way to recognize Kaylee, tongue out, tongue comes out, tongue comes out and hangs way down in front of the face. Have you seen anybody lately who goes around all the time with her tongue sticking out like that? And then finally, the culture wars, cultural Marxism. Little girls now have to worry about going to the bathroom. Little girls, little precious things. You see this quiet, you see these beautiful little girls standing up here. How many of you men would want to protect these little girls? I mean, if you wouldn't, you're not a man. These little girls, beautiful little girls up here. And you know, folks, we got men who want to go in the bathroom, these little girls. And the way they do that is they say, I'm a transgender. And you say, hold on a minute, preacher. I mean, they've had a, they've had a surgery. No, 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 no. You don't understand. You don't understand. There's what's called fluid transgenderism. So what's that? That means that I wake up in the morning, I'm a man. That by noon, I've decided I'm a woman. And then by the evening time, I decide I'm a man again. Plain words, it's all up here. And according to these liberal lax rules that they're coming out with now, you have to acquiesce to whatever they think they are up here in the head. And you have to let this one come in to the bathroom with your little 8, 10, 12-year-old daughter. You know, it's not an issue in the men's bathroom. You understand, men? <laughs> That's not an issue. They're not coming in there after the men. Men take care of themselves. They're talking about the little girls. Right. Right. Fluid. 
I'm this one minute, I'm something else the next. And the American Psychiatric Association, which at one time in this nation was a respectable, honorable society, has completely gone off the deep end and have begun to embrace this insanity. What's all that mean, preacher? It means that the second coming of Christ is nigh. He's coming again. The world is at the doorstep of Sodom and knocking on their door. And boy, they're opening. They're opening, and that's right there. That's where we are. And all I say is this, hallelujah, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. Brother Williams, I wish he'd come right now. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Wouldn't it be something for you all sitting out there and I may disappear right in front of you? <laughs> That'd be wonderful. Some of you say amen. <laughs> you'd be glad that happened, huh? But you'd be disappearing too, wouldn't you, brother? I mean, wouldn't it be something if we're sitting here in this congregation, all of a sudden we're up here preaching, carrying on, singing, doing something, and all of a sudden you hear a sound. And we don't have any windows over here, but if we had windows and we could see that graveyard over there, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Won't be time to get right, folks, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. That's how fast the dispensation of grace comes to an end. It's over. Then you're in the tribulation. Are you ready? Are you ready for something to happen just like that? It's over. Now you're in the tribulation. Are you ready? Even so, come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, in thy holy name, Lord, I preach what you put on my heart. I preach to help people. Father, I, there's not a soul in this house this morning that I, that I don't greatly desire to see in heaven. I want to see them all saved. I want to see them all right with God. Fellowship with them here and rejoice with them here and love the Lord here. and Tell people about the Lord here and live for you here. And then go on out of this world and be with you forever. I want to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus. I want to exalt his precious name. I want people to hear about him, not me. Him, him. He's the one that matters. I don't matter. He matters. I want them to hear about him. Thy blessed son, my Lord Jesus Christ. In thy blessed, sweet, righteous, holy name I pray. And for Jesus' sake I ask it. Amen. Let's stand up this morning.